Don't move, police. Get your hands up, Victor. Don't move. Don't move, put your hands up. Police. Whoa. Police department, keep your hands right there, buddy. I think it would be during June 2019, I was assigned here to the Child Exploitation Group, and uh, we were notified by our office down in Bogota, Colombia, that they had identified an American out of the New York area who was involved in the exploitation of you know, young girls down in Colombia. So we had uh, information come in from our guys at the embassy that uh, two girls were complaining that they had videos posted online of them uh, and they knew the guy that had filmed it who was a U.S. citizen that lived here in Queens, New York. Not only was he trafficking and abusing these, these victims, he would also film the encounters and then upload them to different porn sites. And so like this last year especially, there's been a lot of attention on sites like Pornhub, X Videos, many vids, all these different sites, there's thousands of them and how they don't verify content. And so um, material like this, which um, there is, there, they were underage, so it's CSAM, and it was a sexual assault. He would identify them as uh, the girls that are uh, lacking resources, whether it's family, money, um, the low-lying fruit. You know, I think he viewed this population of um, kids as knowing he can get away with it. They're the kids that no one's looking after. They're the kids that need money. Um, at that age, they probably looked at him as a person of some significance. Um, you know, they didn't realize he's a guy that lives in his mother's basement and has nothing. You know, he's got fake sneakers, fake Rolexes, fake everything. But they viewed this person as an American, as an influential person with a lot of promises. So he uh, styled himself as like a party club promoter and he had uh, contacted probably hundreds and thousands of girls over the years uh, in the, about the 14 to 16 year old age range. And uh, he would uh, chat with them online telling them, oh, you're pretty, would you like to come be in, in a music video or come be at this uh, club opening? And uh, that's how he would make his first contact with them and he would kind of, uh, you know, fill their heads with these ideas of being, you know, a little bit of stardom or, or you're pretty and kind of drag them along like that until he could find a situation or find the right girl uh, from, you know, a poor neighborhood was typically what he was looking for because they would want to do certain things for money. There was a point where we would notice that there was no interest in any of the girls who were over 18. So I, you know, it would be that 14 to 18 year old age group. But I think they're a vulnerable population anyway. Um, and that made them easy targets. I would absolutely uh, classify it as a sex tourism enterprise. You know, number one, you have an American going down there, uh, arranging for girls. Uh, and then at certain points, uh, He's bringing friends, inviting friends to participate along with him. We went down there and we basically worked with the Columbia National Police in identifying these young girls, which was us going, knocking on doors down there with them and sitting down and talking to them. Uh, once we could identify them as a victim, um, then we would refer them to Tyler. Once Tyler got involved, you know, lack of trust in the police, they've already been victimized. Um, you know, we're Americans that are now st st sitting in their living room down in Colombia. Um, there's, all, you know, there's lack of trust, you know, for good reason. So uh, we would um, give the victims Tyler's number. We give Tyler uh, their number and they would match up. Um, the benefit to that was twofold. They'd continue participation, you know, with our case. They'd help us identify other, you know, young victims. But uh, we also were able to op keep communication open with them. So if our prosecutor or we needed something additional, we could go through Tyler. He would get the girls on the phone and it became an easier back and forth. Um, had that not been the case, you know, we would have identified these people, these young girls down in Colombia. We would have left. We would have come back to the United States and 
you know, we don't know that would they really have stuck around for this case. So that's where OUR, I think, brought in a lot of, a lot of positives for us and for the girls, you know, because um, they see a non-law enforcement person who's now providing them, you know, education, counseling, laptops, you know, whatnot. So now I think then they feel like, okay, you know, maybe these guys are, doing, are trying to do the right thing. I'd say the other part of the success is that um, the girls then, they would learn there's an open communication. So o, o, Tyler from OUR, he would call us when the girls did have a question. You know, and he, they'd be down to Columbia, they'd go through him, they'd call us, ask us a simple question. We could give them a simple answer. That would relieve a lot of anxiety for them. And then the flip side of that is when we had a question for one of the girls, um, we were able to go through OUR and get them on the phone in minutes. That never happens. You know, that was, you know, that was truly a success in itself. So, um, you know, aftercare, we always just try to meet the survivors exactly where they're at and not where we'd like them to be. So like high school is, is a need that a lot, of, a lot of the girls like want to accomplish. And I can think of one survivor that because of the abuse that Victor had inflicted on her, she, she wasn't able to finish high school. But that's something that we at OUR were able to help provide as tools so that she could finish high school. And she graduated high school and now she's in college and she's also in an English course based on like the need that she wanted to study English to be able to get a job in the tourism industry in the city that she lives in. For another survivor, the way that people are recognizing her is based on the tattoos that she has because this trafficker um, branded her, essentially. And so that's something that OUR can help fill is um, help cover the cost, get those tattoos removed. Like what it looks like is, is just sitting them down, uh, talking with them, taking them out to dinner, them and their family, and just hearing about them of how we can best assist them in their, in their healing journey. Even just recently in the last couple of days, um, there's a survivor that I was talking to that's been going through quite a bit of anxiety. She's crazy smart. Like she's in veterinarian school. She, she gets great grades. She's a great student, but because of um, some of the mental health concerns that she has, like she's not able to function as, like, as she would like to function. And so she reached out and she's like, I want to see, like, see a therapist. I want to see someone to get mental health therapy. I want to talk to somebody that's good. And because of the relationship that her and I have built, that her and her social workers have built, we were able to get that set up to where she's able to meet weekly um, and we can help cover the transport, um, help cover the, the cost to make that happen, to where she's able to, to work on her mental health as well. And, and so I, she wrote me a note the other day that was like, I'm feeling a little bit better, which is awesome. Like that's all we can ask for is like just a little bit each and every day. And uh, you know, for a little bit like, the way she worded that, maybe a little bit uh, in words, but for her, you could tell it was it was something big. It was this is a big step for me. I feel better. My anxiety is not as strong today, and and uh, and today's a good day.